All right, we ready to get started? Yeah? yeah. Everyone uh, all full from lunch and ready for the last session of the day before you get your drinks? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Hopefully, uh, I won't put you to sleep through this, um, but uh, I'll try to keep it like 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then leave time for questions at the end. Uh, but bear with me if I, if I uh, overshoot that. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, navigating tomorrow, the future of websites in the age of AI and content proliferation. Uh, AI did help me come up with the name of this presentation, uh, <laughs> but that's kind of that's where I stopped using it. So um, hopefully, uh, this will be uh, insightful. And uh, I'll start off by telling you a little bit about myself. My name is John Doyle. Uh, I run a company called Digital Polygon, uh, and we help organizations build websites uh, on the web. Uh, I need to work my sales pitch, but uh, there we go. Uh, outside. Are you doing other something else too? Something like I don't know, a board member or something? Yeah, uh, I'm also a board member for Drupal for Gov. Um, so you know, more information to come on Drupal GovCom later this year. Um, outside of work, uh, I enjoy uh, hiking and snowboarding and uh, boating, uh, or sailing the seven seas. And you can find me, uh, there's my email and my LinkedIn, and I'll share it again at the end. Um, all right, so what are we gonna talk about today? So I'm gonna try to break this up into three sections. We're gonna talk about the evolution of websites for the past 30 years or so, kind of high level. Uh, maybe get a little nostalgic uh, about you know how awesome the web was back in the late 90s. Uh, we'll talk about the expectations of the modern web, and then we'll talk about you know what does the next five years look like and how is that different from where we are today and where we've been in the past and why? And let's start. Uh, at a very high level, uh, the evolution of websites have gone through these like three distinct phases, uh, if I summarize it. The static web in the 90s, where the internet became a thing, we started publishing websites. Uh, in the 2000s, through the dot-com boom, we started uh, integrating in the social web. So you started getting Facebook, and this came with the advancement of technology. Uh, Ajax was, was created. We have APIs now. We have the way to interact with, with users. And really, late 20-teens to 2020s, uh, we're really in the smart web now, uh, where AI is driving uh, changes, and we're looking at decentralization. There's regulations coming through that are pushing for first-party data and things like that. We won't go into blockchain or Web3 or anything like that in this presentation, but um, there are reasons why these concepts are, are uh, starting to take hold. And we'll talk a little bit about it. So let's dive in. In the 1990s, uh, websites were really glorified link, form, link farms linking people to information, right? You had some search engines, they ruled the web, and they tried to get you to this information that was on the web. Uh, and we've really just been iterating on that model ever since. Uh, the differences are, uh, if we fast forward 10 years, uh, the number of users and the number of websites continue to grow exponentially. And as we move into the, the 2010s, uh, more and more uh, users are uh, creating content, blogging, social media, video streaming really became popular. Uh, through this time, and uh, we expanded the number of users by about 20, 20x, and the number of websites by 320x uh, in the 10 year period between 1996 and 2006. So just from a pure information perspective, the number of users and the amount of content that you now have to navigate and, and go through on, on the web is increasing at an exponential rate and uh, cloud started to become reality, making things easier. We went from desktop apps to web-based apps, and all of this contributed to, uh, to this, uh, this change. And if we look at modern websites today, uh, it's not just about having information. It's about having uh, rich experiences. It's about having good visuals, and it's about uh, pleasing the user that is coming to your website. And if we look at numbers, uh, since 2006, the web has about 5x the amount of users, um, has, I didn't do the math on this one, uh, 10x or more, 12x the number of websites. 
And uh, I don't think I have to mention mobile, but 54% of the web traffic comes from mobile devices. And through this evolution from 1996, really, uh, up until 2024, um, there's been some standouts. Google controls 90% of the search traffic today that goes to your website. So Google really has the power to determine which website gets traffic. Um, they do that through machine learning, they do that through indexing, and they do that for, through rankings. Now, they are incentivized to uh, provide the highest quality results to users because if users stop using the platform, they lose all of their revenue. So, uh, you know, I think th they've been doing a, a decent job on this. Um, but the, the, they've created a market, right? The SEO market in the U.S. today is $1.8 billion. Uh, that is a giant market that has been created that people are using to create new content. And uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but this hasn't necessarily been good for us as users, um, right? With more content comes more information that we have to sift through. Uh, and more noise uh, to get to the answers we want because people are just putting out content to try to rank better to get people to their websites. Um, and uh, I think just another important note is the online e-commerce market cap uh, this year is $6.3 trillion. So the amount of money being generated from websites and web applications and online experiences is growing tremendously. Um, and this is going to continue to grow, which is continue to push that technical evolution faster and faster because there's more and more money to be made. Um, so uh, just to recap all of that, <coughs> current websites need to provide users with end-to-end -end experiences. And if we talk about feature sets, this means high-quality content. This means uh, multiple types of content, not just written content, but video content. Um, audio content, motion to please users that are, that are coming through here. Uh, strong user analytics are kind of required in today's world uh, to be able to help you personalize your content to understand your user and move it forward. Uh, search and chat. Um, I added chat in here because uh, it really is becoming uh, more and more important today, though I think it's going to continue to evolve really fast, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and then finally, security and privacy. Uh, I don't know, I, I talk a lot about privacy as well and how regulations are gonna change this and we're, we're working on uh, pushing uh, information back to users, the, the control of their information back to users and this is, uh, again, driving a lot of the shift from third party cookies to first party cookies and impacting how we build websites and how we interact with users and how we use that data. Um, it's also a driver to Web 3.0 and decentralization and, um, uh, again, I'll go in a rabbit hole if I keep talking about that, but these things are driving our websites today and we need to, to move that forward. From an experience perspective, uh, websites are expected to be accessible. Uh, more and more laws are coming out on this and we need to pay attention to it. The EU is about to pass the inaccessibility law like they did privacy and start coming after websites that aren't accessible. Um, so I see this regulation driving more and more change in these areas, which means the complexity of our websites is going to increase and uh, the amount of functionality they need to provide with the same size teams and the same budgets or smaller budgets uh, are going to continue to, to increase. Um, engaging visual designs and personalized user experiences, again, are, are pretty much the bar in 2024. Um, I think if anyone's not doing this now, uh, they need to look at how they're going to be able to do this in the near future, uh, or they're, they're already being uh, surpassed by their competitors that are. So these are, these are kind of like the bar today on, on what I see in modern websites. So how did we get here? Um, I kind of walked you through the evolution and uh, talked briefly about technology driving this, but let's dive into uh, kind of summary of these driving forces that got us to the expectations of websites today. Uh, the first is the advancement of technology, right? As technology evolves, it makes things easier, right? We don't have to write compiler code anymore to run our, our Windows machines or our, our laptops at all. Uh, we can build on top of them, and this continues to create uh, more and more uh, diversity in the market and more and more competition. 
Uh, technology enables faster and more efficient creation of new solutions. Uh, low code, no code is now becoming a thing. Um, well, has been a thing for a while, but is continuing to put more competitors in the market. And technology allows for new composable business models. And what I mean by this is uh, think about your aggregators, right? Through companies publishing APIs, I can now have uh, complex banking apps um, or travel apps that don't just do one thing. They do multiple things. So I can book a flight, and then I can also book a rental car and a hotel through my banking site instead of going back to three different websites to do it. So this, uh, this evolution is making those things easier, which is, again, uh, creating more competition and more noise in the market, right? Now I don't have my hotel sites creating contents about hotels. I have my banks creating content on hotels, and I've got my travel sites creating content on hotels, and I've got my hotels creating content on hotels, and the amount of content out there is just continuing to increase. Uh, saturation of markets and competition. With the advancement, uh, it means lower barriers to entry. I can now create uh, solutions in much less time with much less effort. Uh, and uh, you know, people have paved the way for me to kind of replicate what they've been doing and, and make money on it. Uh, more competitors means more options for customers. It means you need to do more to stand out. You know, having a solution isn't enough anymore. It means you have to create more content and you have to stand out from, uh, from your competitors. And it's more options for customers means more need to differentiate. That's why you're seeing uh, a ton of like, high profile brands start looking at other avenues of connecting with their audiences. Social media being the biggest ones. Uh, I don't know if people use TikTok, Instagram, but a lot of your mainstream brands and even B2B brands are experimenting with social platforms and finding success doing that because they're differentiated from their competitors that aren't. And it, it helps keep them top of mind and, I won't get into the marketing side of this, uh, but uh, that's, that's what's uh, happening. That's what users are expecting today. And lastly, the increase of content. So more organizations moving to this space means more content's being created. Uh, it's more competition for keywords and search rankings, and it doesn't even mean they're your competitors, but you're still competing with them to rank in Google, which controls 90% of the traffic that comes to your website from a search perspective, which is, a tremendous amount of content or, or traffic, I mean. And um, SEO generally encourages you to create more content and traditionally has. Um, obviously, there's been shifts recently into uh, high quality content and uh, better technical experiences for users now that there's so much content out there and the content's kind of baseline. It's okay, who can provide the best user experience? It ties into site speed and things like that, but um, generally, SEOs will recommend more content um, to get you to rank better. And that's continuing to uh, contribute to this, this constant growth and this, this saturation of the market. Um, and AI is just going to make this worse. Um, <laughs> so technology advancement is impacting uh, this uh, shift in many ways. And I'm going to group this into two buckets. So. Uh, AI is going to make your technology move faster because uh, development times will decrease, low-code, no-code solutions will expand rapidly, which means I can do more, I can create more solutions, and there's more market cap for it. So marketers can go buy off-the-shelf solutions that do things they used to need developers for, and when that happens, there's a market for it, um, which means more and more of these tools are going to be created. Uh, and competitors and point solutions are going to be created daily, which is going to continue to increase the amount of content and the noise that's there. And it's going to be near impossible to figure out if uh, this solution is going to solve my whole problem or if they're just selling me this solution because they want to make a sale. Um, the impact to users' behaviors and expectations are going to change. Uh, I think search first ask is one that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of right now, a lot of People are going to ChatGPT to get answers instead of searching for it. And I think we're going to continue to see uh, evolution of this behavior because I don't have to search on Google, then go to someone's website, and then click through links to find the answer. I'm just given the answer. And that type of behavior is now being expected on websites. So those who are first to market with chatbots on their websites that can give someone an answer and 
not make them search uh, are going to see success uh, in, in the market. Um, and then we're seeing shifting buyer personas. And I talked about it a little bit before, but the uh, lower complexity of the solutions means new people can buy them, right? So I have marketers running websites, and that's been going on for a while. Uh, but I don't need an IT team to set up my website and launch it. I can do that as a marketer. And uh, we're going to continue to see this with point solutions. Like, I don't know how many of you have marketing teams who use Zapier for integrating data between websites that would traditionally require migrations and databases and, uh, and things like that. And uh, the, the, the barriers and the complexity of these tools are continuing to decrease, which means we're not just selling to IT teams or developers anymore. We're selling to marketers. We're selling to hybrid marketing developers and uh, looking at different ways to approach this. And I think this is some of the reasons that we saw what we saw on the Dries note today. Um, is, is we want to try to cater to, to more people, but AI is going to continue to push this evolution forward. All right, so websites of tomorrow. Uh, I'm not going to pitch that we're going to use uh, Apple Pros, and this is going to be the future, but I, I like the picture. Um, but I think it's important to understand that the bar is constantly uh, moving. It's constantly changing, and we're going to continue to see an even more rapid evolution of uh, speed of change. And uh, I think you know, Elon Musk is uh, in and out of the media, but uh, I like his quote here, that we've got to be careful, careful because AI is capable uh, of more than most of us know. Um, but what I want to focus on here is the rate of improvement is exponential. And technology has been moving fast, but AI is going to enable it to move even faster. Um, and let's talk about some of the ways that AI is impacting what we do today from the web perspective. AI is augmenting content generation. Uh, most people have probably used ChatGPT, um, but it's making content easier to create than ever before, uh, generating new drafts, reviewing and optimizing content. Um, or maybe even bulk generating blogs in seconds. Uh, I don't think I'm going to recommend this, but uh, I actually pulled this from Shopify. I should be better at noting my captions. But um, I, I think this is uh, one thing that's being used to to make our lives even harder as people are trying to differentiate. And I'll get into to how we can stand out in the market as we do this. But um, this is, it's having a huge impact in this area. Uh, AI is augmenting user experiences. Uh, I'm really going to tie this into personalization. And uh, AI is able to analyze the data and make real-time uh, suggestions that would traditionally take a data analyst going through the data, grouping things together, looking at patterns, and driving that. So they're, they're taking the time that's required to do that to a much, much shorter time span. And, it's able to improve and, and build on this feedback. And a lot of the customer data pa uh, platforms are incorporating this machine learning and, and AI capabilities into their, uh, into their platforms to uh, bubble up this information. And uh, you'll see it in, in pretty much every tool nowadays. AI is becoming this buzzword. But you're seeing recommendations come through the data that, that they're pushing there. Uh, it's augmenting findability and customer support. Uh, natural language chatbots are. Uh, like I said, going to become more of the norm, but they're already starting to take root. Um, they're providing answers to users directly. They're helping troubleshoot issues, offering contextual assistance, and providing code examples uh, for, uh, for developers that are looking to integrate uh, applications in some cases. So uh, very powerful uh, AI-driven interaction with users that Maybe in the past you had a person doing, or maybe just didn't offer at all. You made them search your website. AI is augmenting development. So uh, for all my developers in here, intelligent suggestions, autocomplete, and code generation. Uh, I don't know how many people have used Copilot. Yeah, a couple of people. If you're not, you should uh, check it out. It's, uh, or, or one of the competitors. Uh, it's really helpful. Helps speed things up. It, won't let you uh, not do your job anymore, but uh, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, Real-time error detection and standard enforcements. 
Um, I think Drupal Florida campus had a, had a nice uh, boff session earlier this year uh, where they went through like AI tools that they were playing around with and I saw one called Code Rabbit that was pretty cool doing automated code reviews and checking code quality and standards without you having to build and configure like PHP CS uh, for, for two sprints uh, to, to get that working. And then full application development and integrations. Uh, has anyone seen the YouTube video about Devin or the debunk myths about Devin? No? Okay. Well, uh, AI agents are going to become a thing. There's proof of concepts of the, these agents out there that will take in real-time context and actually build you applications based on prompts. Um, Devin was one that was, was put out where they had them go on to like Fiverr and pick a task and then actually build you an application with an integration and uh, it worked for the specific use case that it was. But I think it will advance and, and continue to uh, be able to make us faster, uh, make developers faster than, than ever before. Um, so that's really the, the, the message I want to leave behind here is that AI will drive change faster than ever. And if we take a look back at the uh, ways that technology has evolved over the last uh, 10 years, we can look at how AI is going to impact these. So AI will rapidly increase the rate of technical evolution from where it is today. Uh, it'll more rapidly increase the number of solutions and competitors in the market, which is, means that you're going to continue to struggle to keep up and stand out from, uh, from those competitors. And it'll rapidly increase the amount of comp uh, competing content in the market driven by more competitors and more solutions out there. Um, so, you know, the market share is going to continue to uh, be harder to attain. So while you're all here, like, why are you here? So we can, <laughs> uh, how can we keep up with this, right? Um, I want to start off with uh, another quote. Artificial intelligence is not a replacement for humans, but it's about amplifying human potential. And I think this is the message I want to leave everyone with, is that uh, it's not a magic bullet, and it's not going to uh, completely replace you or your job or thinking, at least not in the next five years. Um, but it will augment you and allow you to keep up with uh, the changing environment that we're going to face. And uh, here's my perspective of what AI will and will not do over the next five years. I think the first is it will accelerate the pace of content creation. Uh, it'll accelerate, or, or yeah, the increase in competition in your marketplaces. It sound like a broken record. Uh, decrease the complexity of using these technologies and solutions and augment uh, your team so that you can do more. And it won't replace you and it won't be a magic bullet to do your entire job for you. And uh, I'll get into this a little bit in the, in the future slides, but uh, where I've seen AI fail, uh, I guess, the most is when teams try to use it to do the job without understanding uh, what the subject matter is. So if we take content strategy or SEO, sure, it can write you a blog. And you can have someone that says, OK, I need you to write me a blog on hotels. It can get you that. Uh, but if you don't understand the market and the persona and the audience, you're not going to be able to write a script that's good enough to compete in the market. And you're just going to be throwing more garbage out there. And uh, my first recommendation is invest in your content. Um, even though AI will help you create it, it'll augment it, uh, high quality content is the number one uh, driver of ranking for Google, right? It still is. And uh, high quality content is also what is used to train your AI tools that you're going to use in your site for your chatbot. And uh, it's kind of this garbage in, garbage out type of, of deal. Um, and content is also going to uh, allow you to move faster in the future. And I'll get into this in the next slide where I'm talking about your CMS. but. Um, your content structure and your data model and ensuring that that is not coupled with your front end design is the only way that you're going to be able to move quicker uh, than the market uh, in the future uh, for enterprise sites at least. 
or this is what I feel. So, um, you know, the two to three year rebuild cycle is going to be a thing of the past. Technology is moving too fast for you to not make feature enhancements or improvements to your website in a two year time span. Um, we're going to be looking at six month cycles, uh, maybe less. And we'll be really focusing on the things that are the most important. And if you decouple your content from your display, then you could rebrand your website without rebuilding it. You could just put a new front end on it, right? And I'm not, this doesn't have to be decoupled. You can do this in Drupal. Um, you can build good content models and then do theming on top of it and then just redo the theme or the branding on top of it. So, um, you know, I think just remember that as technology moves faster, you have to move faster to keep up with it. And by having good fundamentals and good structure of what you're creating and, and how that's portrayed, it'll give you more flexibility to, to drive this in the future. Invest in your people. Um, I think we really need to be careful with the promises of AI of replacing people. It'll make us do our jobs uh, better and make us do more, but why can't we offer more for the same price? instead of trying to offer more for less. Um, how do we use our teams to be able to do more and uh, drive more value for our customers as opposed to cutting down and then not putting any strategy behind the content that we're putting out? Um, you know, if you couple AI with unqualified resources, again, you're gonna fail. Um, and uh, the, new, the newest Google update in March, right, de-indexed uh, a bunch of AI-generated websites. So if, if you're trying to rely on this solely, uh, you know, a lot of influencer businesses completely went under <laughs> when this happened and maybe they quit their jobs and, and, and did this because they had a revenue stream and Google still owns that market. So uh, I guess it's just a word of caution that I think people are still imperative for uh, uh, using AI to drive uh, innovation here uh, for the web perspective anyway. Uh, invest in your data. So privacy and securities are definitely drivers for brand trust as we continue to go into the market. I think uh, if you look at kind of the flows, uh, I kind of like this, this like, uh, this, this, uh, like divergent and convergent uh, pattern that I see happening. Like as more and more content gets out there, you've got a lot more options. And then if everyone starts using AI to generate their content, everything's gonna come to like more sameness. And then those brands that create unique content and unique experiences continue to take market share again. Um, so I think, I think we're kind of in that trend. We're seeing a lot of businesses uh, get rid of people and use AI, and I think uh, that's actually gonna hurt them in the long run uh, if they're not smart about how they leverage that and, and make sure that the strategy is still there. Um, as these regulations intensify, I think there's a lot of movement from, again, third-party data to first-party data. Uh, brands who can invest in their, uh, their content uh, are gonna succeed more in the future. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, in the last 20 years, all of the trillion dollar market cap companies focused on data, right? Amazon, Google, Facebook. It was all about the data they had and the power that they had to use that data to influence users to do, to take actions. Um, so uh, as that starts to go away with privacy and regulation decentralization, uh, those organizations who invest in this uh, are going to continue to remain on top. And a lot of these platforms are integrating AI into their machine learning algorithms. Um, I think Lytx uh, is doing a, a session tomorrow, um, as well as uh, we'll be at the Pantheon booth. I think I've seen, I haven't used their platform yet, but really excited to kind of see what they can do with like short-term, real-time personalization. So definitely check them out. And then lastly, uh, invest in your brand experience. I think brand experience is paramount to the future of success for you standing out. I think there's been uh, years in the past where organizations were more focused on getting content out there and getting users. The brand wasn't as important, but as you have more competitors, as you have more content, building that stickiness with your customers, building that loyalty, um, having them be able to know they can trust you uh, is gonna be really important because like, I don't know if you Google search things nowadays, but how do you know what's real? How do you know what's truth? And you know, we've seen a ton of market manipulation with, with just fake information. 
Um, so I think this brand loyalty and trust is, we're, we're seeing signals that this is becoming more and more important to, to, to users. Um, and that's what I have for you today. Uh, okay, I wanna open up for questions if anyone has any. Uh, I think we can turn on the other mic and uh, have you come up. Or you can shout them out and I'll repeat them if you don't want to come up. Okay, I can shout one out. Uh, how do you see AI being used for cognitive disabilities? All right, so the question is, how do we see AI being used for cognitive disabilities? Uh, I think there's a lot of ways that this AI uh, can help move this forward. And I think the first is accessibility and driving better content and, and better uh, optimization of that content on websites to better uh, talk to assistive technologies uh, is, is like the low hanging fruit here. Um, there's no reason why you can't leverage AI to generate, uh, take your content and then build alt text and uh, better de data attributes for your HTML and, and make that more trivial. Like right now it's really an afterthought. So how do we automate uh, ways that we can do that better? Um, and then I think, uh, you know, at some point AI will be integrated into these technologies to better understand the information that's taking in and, and try to drive it. I think uh, personally, Reliable AI is, is a concept, and you know, having AI hallucinate on the things that it's reading and, and put that out is dangerous. So how do we, how does, how does a company control that to make sure it's getting good valid data and pushing that forward and uh, not spouting nonsense that it comes up with? Um, so I, I think in the short term, it's really gonna be about optimizing sites and using that for us to provide better content and and better structures so that uh, assistive technologies can uh, can better interact with the content that you have out there. Anyone else? Um, do you think there is a, you mentioned uh, the search uh, being replaced with the prompt of AI. Do you see a significant uh, risk for the current Google business model being completely replaced Yeah. So the question is, with with uh, search or, or chat prompts and chat GPT, for example, uh, changing the search versus ask paradigm, uh, you know, where does Google and other search engines live in this? Uh, I think we're going to continue to see users shift to these other platforms. I think there's going to be and there already are a lot of lawsuits on where did you get this information for? Is it valid? Uh, is it real? So I think we're gonna see an evolution in this space. Uh, I think if ChatGPT or Google uh, continues to have this ask functionality, which you know we've seen Bing and, and Google put out some AI versions of this that give you better answers, but right now that undermines their entire business model with ads, right? So. How do you, how do they solve that problem? I don't know yet. Uh, just to add on to that, I, one thing to check out is Google's SPD initiative. Okay. Search generated experience. It's their new AI generated ad. It's taking asked questions and, and now it's in their ad channel. Their nice. So search generated ads? Experience. Experience. Search generated experience is a Google product that, uh, takes those questions and ties it into their ad space. Yeah, and generates answers. And generates answers for you. Yeah. That's awesome. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> uh, Stack overflow traffic is down. Yeah. I mean, this, this is it, right? Like, we're seeing a huge market shift right now that is going to take businesses down. And anyone that, that isn't prepared for this, I mean, even Google's facing a lot, a lot of problems with this, and, and they're working on, on, on pivoting, but we're gonna see shifts in uh, global economic markets based on the AI tools that are now going mainstream. So right, I'll come back to you in a second. He has his hand up first. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, so the question was, we have SEO for optimizing for search engines. Are we going to have LLMEO or some way to optimize it for, for chatbots? I think the answer is yes. Uh, I've had a couple strategy sessions on like trying to predict where this is going to go. Um, I think what I've come down to right now, and I've even asked ChatGPT, and of course it won't answer me, but the, <laughs> the concepts that it gives me are that, uh, and, and how I think about it is, the bar right now is high quality content, and the way high quality content is deciphered is Google's algorithm, right? Backlinks, it's high quality content, it's uh, you know answering people's questions with contextual information and providing them with good solutions. Uh, I think that is going to continue to be the bar. I think uh, you know OpenAI crawls the web and indexes sites to train its LLMs to get this content. I think the the way that it does this and the way we evolve, I, I can't really speculate on like, are we gonna need better metadata because AI can actually crawl your whole website and understand or hallucinate better on what you mean. Uh, but I think the semantic mar markup is gonna be a thing and I think in certain markets, uh, better specifying how AI can interact with your content or your platform or your APIs even uh, is going to, uh, to be something that we see evolve. So I think, yes, there will be change there and there will be uh, shifts on it, but I think the core fundamentals, at least over the next couple of years, will remain the same drivers. Like, how do we determine this is a good site? Uh, it's from backlinks, it's from quality content, and like Google will continue to help drive that in the short term. Yeah. This may not be such a serious question, but I'm just curious, um, when you go to websites now, you have about us, contact us, mm -hmm. newsletters, sign up, this and that. Um, what is AI likely to give us to change content staples that we've grown used to over, say, the last 10, 15 years? All right, so the question is, like, when you go to a website, you've got a lot of core fundamental information about a business, like about contact us and, and things like that, and how is AI going to, or what is AI going to give us to like that will become part of websites. That's going to become part of websites. Yeah. Okay, um, I think you're going to continue to see. I mean, it's already there, but a growth of FAQs, right? Like you're going to make it easier for them to understand. Hey, here's the question, and hey, I have the answer. And uh, you know, back to the LLM question, I think users are going to start putting more of their own brand in the responses hoping that when the LLM returns their response or stuff taken from their website, it'll actually reference them in it. Um, I'm sure there's pieces of the algorithms that don't do that, because uh, you hardly ever see it in GPT, but um, if you change the prompts around, like, uh, I guess an example is I asked ChatGPT, give me statistics for, for websites like growth. And it was like, well, in this fig figmented world, here are some statistics. I was like, okay, can you cite these sources? And I was like, no, we can't do that. And I was like, okay, well, if you're gonna cite them, where would I find this information? And when I did that, it gave me like Forbes and like actually did real citations that were real websites. It just wouldn't uh, put any, uh, it wouldn't say, I got this from this, right? Because if the information changed, it didn't want to be liable. But uh, you can start to see that if you play around with the prompts and, and ask questions to get around uh, some of the safeguards, uh, you can see uh, where they've got some of that info. So, yeah. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, stick around.